Now, do you ever think you'll be a pastor? Let's oh. <laughs> <laughs> run church. Yeah. No. <laughs> As a younger writer and worship leader, I wasn't seen for so long. And I think being hidden in the Lord and writing in hiddenness where no one heard the songs, but I would labor for hours and hours on these songs. People are wanting to be seen earlier and wanting their songs to be listened to early. We've lost the hiddenness of wow. writing for the Lord and yeah. singing for the Lord first. How do we get that back though? If there's, you know, young worship leaders and, and writers listening to this, learn how to Hey everybody, this is Rita Springer. Welcome again to the Rita Springer podcast and worship is my weapon. Today on the show, I love this guy so much. He's become a good friend. Mitch Wong is an amazing worship leader. He's an amazing songwriter. He's an amazing husband and soon to be father. Welcome to the show, Mitch. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was three months away from moving to Nashville because I got my visa ready, everything locked away. Because I... you wanted to go with them. No. Oh, no. They that had already it. been there for eight years. Oh. So, so eight years pass and I start writing songs for church. And then and I you're get still connected there with... still there at Planet Shakers. It's still the church at Planet that Shakers. they were at. Yeah. Then I start touring as a keyboard player and run into Adrian Thompson at Desperation Conference in Colorado Springs. And Adrian at the time is working with... With Integrity. And Planet Shakers at the time was in, with, with Integrity. integrity. So yeah, he knew that I was starting to write songs. Yeah. So he off the cuff just said, would you want to write songs in Nashville sometime? Just let us know. And I had been praying for that. So I would ran with it, booked a three-week trip as soon as I got home. And then that was the end of 2016. And then two years... After that, I was in a belonging service and I felt the Lord say, you can have an awesome life in Melbourne and I'll bless it. Or you can jump at the deep end in Nashville with me and see what happens. But are you a songwriter up to that point? Like, did you grow up thinking, I'm going to write songs for the church? I started at 15. Yeah. Then it, by 18, it was not a hobby anymore. It was an obsession. Okay. Okay. And then... By 21, no, 22, I had gone through a year of really hard year. I was depressed for a year, just recovering from some things that had happened. And then I wrote two songs out of that season. And when I heard the church sing them, that was when I knew that I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like this... The um, the podcast is called Worship is My Weapon. I always try okay. to find out yeah. when I have writers in here, like for you, what was the weapon of worship? Like what what did what worship help you? Was it through depression? Was it yeah. is that where it first was like, oh my gosh, I need it for that? Well, it depends who the weapon's for. Yeah. So for me, I think having an outlet to speak with God and to receive revelation, but also no, to, to have revelation, put it into a song for someone else, but then also listen back to it and receive from it yourself. Yeah. It was kind of this really therapeutic yeah. thing for me. Um, but I think the weapon that I found in worship was honesty wow. because okay. when I had been writing songs for you know, six years. And when I went through this really difficult year and wrote a song called I Know Who You Are, um, there was a lyric in the bridge where it said, I may not have much left, but you provide. That's yeah. the that's how the lyric in the bridge starts. And I remember the day that that came, I sat down at the piano and I said to myself, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and write a song purposely because I had been getting so frustrated because no songs were coming. And I just said to myself, I'm literally just going to play how I'm feeling in my heart. Yeah. I'm just going to play it. I don't want to say anything. And then I started playing this progression and these lyrics came out <laughs> just, you know, yeah. automatically. Uh, and it was, I may not have much left, but you provide. And that lyric for me then meant I may not have much left time on earth 
I don't know how many days I have. Yeah. I'm at this low place. Wow. And it was combined with this faith statement of, but I know you provide. Yeah. So that was the first song where it felt like I was being truly honest and full of faith at the same time and not just being a facade of, I know all the things to say, I know all the right yeah. expressions, all the right verses, all the right lyrics to say. It wasn't fake. It was really being truly honest. And um, so when I saw that song minister to people, I think that honesty was like a, it was a weapon because it, it disarmed yeah. and it opened so many hearts up to receive the revelation that God does provide in, yeah. our, in our most broken state. And I love that I didn't need to say in the song, I was so depressed, but you provide, it was just, right. it was a lyric that really, yeah, just came from <laughs> where I truly was. And I yeah. think um, that's what the Lord is seeking. And I think that song taught me how to write from honesty and not to be afraid. See, I love that about you, Mitch, because that now is like, that's why for me, it's like the, that's why knowing you, mm -hmm. because there is such honesty, mm -hmm. um, in, in, and almost, I think an intentionality in the songs that you do. Right. So I always love, um, I love the conversation of finding out with writers, especially guy writers, yeah. because guy writers, just their thought process is different than girl writers. Mm -hmm. And it always, when you got a guy writer that, to me, you're the guy writer that, um, that carries a lot of emotion in what you do. Yeah. <clears throat> and not all guy writers are like that. Yeah. Um, you know, if I am going to listen to a Mitch Wong song, I'm going to know that it's going to be a gut puncher. Mm -hmm. And that's not typical for all the guy writers. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I love that about you, which that explains it to me. If you are... If you're, if the first time or what I'm hearing you say is like one of the most central times that you heard your song, somebody grabbing a hold of your song and singing it back, that's what you realize. Yeah. And so do you, is that the, is that the platform from which you write from now is that place? Yeah. I think it's always a wrestle for me and a constant heart check of, is this genuine? Yeah. Is this yeah. really coming from a place of truth and a place of desire to minister? And because that one truly did. Yeah. And it actually didn't even come from a desire to minister to people. It was just a, a straight prayer to the Lord and a, a reminder of faith. And I think that one became a foundational block for songwriting for me from that point forward yeah. because I saw how much. I was ministered to by being honest and not pretending like I had it all together. And I think one of the things that I really felt passionately about moving to Nashville was I wanted to contribute to faith filled songs yeah, and not just emotional songs, because I think it should work hand in hand yeah. where you want to be honest with God where you're at, but you don't want to sit in that for too long and you don't want to forget yeah. your faith as well. Yeah. So I think Yeah. Um, I had grown up with songs with Planet Shakers that were so radically faith-filled that I wanted to steward that and carry that into yeah. songs and just partner that with, um, you know, obviously working on the craft of songs and melody mm. and all that, but just to keep my heart posture where I was writing from truth and not just um, muscle memory. Hey, everybody, this is Rita Springer. Thank you so much for coming in and joining me on the podcast here with Worship Is My Weapon. There's a lot of things I'm doing right now, and one of the things that we provide um, alongside this podcast is a newsletter that we do that we send out to those of you that are subscribed where um, I just answer questions and um, kind of give you information. And sometimes you guys are able to um, write in with questions uh, that you um, just are curious about. We love that. We love that interaction. I actually love to interact with those of you that um, want something a little bit more beyond the, the podcast. So if that's you, make sure to, to 
um, get our newsletter, sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the newsletter, and stay in touch with all the things that we're doing here on the podcast in that newsletter. You know how, how it is. I think this cup says, pour yourself a cup of ambition. XO Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> Dolly Parton's the best. But I think even in like this city that there, there is, I think ambition is a word where it can be good. You can have good ambition to do things for the Lord and you can have ambition for yourself. Yeah. And I think that has been a real wrestle for me. Okay. Because coming to Nashville, I really wanted to protect the tenderness of writing. I never wanted it to become just churning out songs for yeah. the machine. And I think that song back when I was 21 or 22, when I wrote, I know who you are, I always come back to that because it reminds me of what it is to write from truth. Yeah. And not for ambition, not to get accolade, not to impress someone else, but just to write honestly where you are. How do you keep that though, Mitz? Because, you know, you just said something um, where uh, you wanted to um, pour into, you know, faith-filled songs and emotional, like like put both of those together. And I felt like one of my like crossroads that I came to was before I started making this, this record is that I didn't want to contribute anymore to, um, what wasn't real. Mm-hmm. Like that was just, what was just like, we're writing songs to write songs, to get royalty checks and, yeah. and to, to climb on the CCLI charts. Yeah. And cause there is so much of that in, um, in Nashville mm-hmm. and in some of the songwriting mentality. And so, because I, I sometimes know too many things I felt like I had come to the to this place where I'm like I don't know if I want to contribute anymore to this. Yeah. And because my whole life has been about giving the honest faith-filled songs. Yeah. And so when you when then you throw in a word like ambition, where is the balance of ambition as a writer in church music because I mean there is a, an an income there. Yeah. You know, we we all make an income from that. As a guy, I think, again, girls struggle with this in a different, Mm -hmm. women writers struggle with this in a different area because we don't have, it pretty much still is a a, kind of a male led world. How do you balance ambition? Mm -hmm. Like for the good part of it and then the sticky part of it in your songwriting skills, because you are, you're a one that goes in and if anybody knows you, they know Mitch is a man of God. So it's not like anybody really has to worry. Like you just have mm-hmm. a great reputation. But Thanks. at all times, that's a slippery slope. Absolutely. So how do you maintain the balance of that as a songwriter and and not get caught up in... Because Mitch, we have the ability to write insanely amazing songs mm-hmm. for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. And so where's the balance for you as a male writer in that? Yeah, I think... There's a lot in that. I think one of the things that has helped me is knowing that to maintain a pure heart is not a once-off decision. It's liberate. Yeah. It's liberating to know that and yeah. to know I'm going to keep on having to come back and back and back yeah. and back again and again. And I think that is encouraging to me because the Lord is with us and is walking with us and is constantly pushing our feet back back on the narrow path if we let him. Yeah. So I think it's one, I have to always keep my heart soft to yeah. his correction. Yeah. And also be willing to search my heart and and have an attitude that says, I don't want to have anything in my heart that's going to offend him. Yeah. So that has been helpful to me knowing that this is going to be a many times decision, not just a once off. Yeah. But I think speaking of ambition, it just makes me think of when David was chosen out of his brothers. Yeah. Samuel thought it surely it must be this guy. Surely, surely, yeah. surely, surely. And then in the end it was David who wasn't even in the room. And I think there's a way to see things in man's eyes and there's a way to see things in God's eyes. So when I think ambition, yeah. I think what am I ambitious for? Is it for the things that the world sees or is it for the things that are the priorities of the kingdom? And I think that 
I'm, I think there's a good type of ambition if it aligns with that God perspective that we don't always see and that takes time to see. Well, and you're, you're <clears> also <throat> in what you're saying, it's like, you have to be willing to hold yourself accountable yeah. to, to time with the Lord mm -hmm. and time in the presence of the Lord. I think that is another thing that is trustworthy about you is that anybody who knows you knows that you know the Lord and that I think you came to the table with that first, mm -hmm. you know, even you were just t talking about this story, telling this story about, about learning how to play the keys and then kind of being thrown into it on the road with, with Henry Seeley. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty good piano player, but I still get, if somebody asks me to play for them, I start sweating bullets. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I can't even imagine. And, and I think that's a good thing Yeah. because it makes me realize what I don't have. Yep. And it puts me in a place of caution, 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 get your act together, get your, you know, and dependence. Yes. Yeah. Complete yeah. dependence. Yeah. And I think maybe there's something in that, that I do see on you mm. that it's, you don't walk around thinking you're all that, mm -hmm. even though you don't walk into a songwriting room and think, oh, I, don't, I don't think I could get through this. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like I used to do that all the time. And there's a confidence that you can go into. Yeah. But it is such a sticky world. This is like yeah. a, this environment that we're in. It's just a, it's a really crazy place. Yeah. And are we writing songs? Like when you go to write a song, because you've written some really beautiful songs and you've written, written some songs that haven't you won a Grammy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like when you have that kind of success, how do you then measure the next song you're writing? Yeah. Like I want to get into the nitty gritty of do you, do you, when you go in and you're like, is this the next Grammy song? <laughs> I mean, do you yeah. think like that or no. do you have to hold yourself back and be like, well, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Well, that's the thing I'm, I wanted to say about ambition is I think it's very easy to see ambition in terms of awards and yeah. Grammys and doves and all that kind of stuff. But then the way I connect a good type of ambition with songwriting is, is this true to what the room is like every single person in the room, are they going to be, be ministered to by that song? Is there going to be a, like testimony from this song. That's the kind of the treasure that I get from when I write songs is when I hear people singing it. Well, s uh, singing it, but also having said, you know, this song found yeah, me. The testimony. Um, yeah. So believe for it. Yeah. There was a lady who walked up to me in a church in Orange County and she said, I just had to leave my partner who's being abusive, mm. take my daughters away from him. And this was the song that got me through. And she was in tears and I'm, I'm crying. And it's just to know that I have been a part of helping someone yeah. through some, something awful like that. That is the kind of like thing I'm ambitious for is yeah. who is this going to reach? And even if it's, I'm not even talking numerically how many testimonies it's going to get. Yeah. It's like if this reaches one person, does the one thing like if I've always said like releasing songs, if it gets fifty streams and it reaches fifty people and it was supposed to reach those fifty people, it's not wasted. Yeah. Which it's really liberating to yes. think about it like that because then it's all in God's hands. That's it's right. not on me. Yeah. So yeah, bringing it back to like like awards and I don't think like that. And I, I consciously don't look at CCLI lists and I don't look at those kinds of things because I know that it can be very easy to get in there, to get yeah. in there and to become yeah. motivation. So I purposely, I'm like, no, I actually can't afford to let that become my motivation. Yeah, It has to be grounded in. I want to minister to the Lord. I want to help his people because this is a gift that we're able to use yeah. for him. Yeah. And I'm coming back to that word priesthood. Mm. Like we actually have a responsibility to use our gifts for him. 
yeah. and to create a beautiful space for him to fill. Um, I think about the man that God chose to build the tabernacle, Bezalel, mm. and how he was so skilled, spirit-filled, but he built this tabernacle and it was for the Lord. And it's the simplicity of like, I want to build a space for the Lord to inhabit and to use it for whatever he wants to do. That's my goal as a songwriter mm. is to build him a space. Um, so it is things like that. I'm not going to lie. Like sometimes there'll be a thought of like, it, like in terms of awards and kind of like, I'm not a perfect person, Yeah. but I, I definitely make a, a decision not to let that motivate me Yeah. because I think once you've like believe for it, getting a Grammy was so encouraging and awesome. And actually side note, that was a miracle that God worked for us to yeah, get a green card. What was card. the story? What's the yeah. song story behind that particular one? Cause I know that was a really beautiful story. In yeah. There. So a little unexpected, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kyle Lee, Dwan Hill, we were writing and they were working on CC's project yeah. and they already had 12 songs. So the, the record was done, but Kyle felt, I just think there's one more song for her. Wow. And we actually got together. We wrote another song and it, and it wasn't the right fit. So then he's like, no, I still feel like there's one. And we just decided, let's take a few days, pray about it, seek the Lord. And Kyle was mowing his lawn and was praying. And is like, I know there's something, Lord, we just have to believe for it. And it just kind of wow, came up in prayer. Yeah. So then that leads to us writing the song and it was a really cool experience. We wrote it on Google Docs because it was during the pandemic. Wow. So it was kind of That's right. a really cool this. experience. But uh, my like miracle from that was we couldn't get back home to Australia and we hadn't seen our family in two and a half years. That's right. So we were believing for God to open up a way to see Dude. our family because yeah. I never in my whole life thought that I wouldn't see my family for multiple years Oof. at a time. It was just not in my thinking. So we were desperate and we went to our immigration lawyer and he said off the cuff, you know, um, to get a green card in the O one, one like the creative space, you have to pretty much get a Grammy. And then fast forward a few months, uh, belief for it gets released and then nominated and then it wins on the night. And are you just, are you just, is your mouth gaping open? We, well, are you, the, were you the, there? The special thing I was, okay. so the, the special thing was we were there and it was so encouraging. I was so like honored to be part of the song yeah. and for CC to sing it. And I love that encouragement, but Steph and I look at each other on the night and we know this is the Lord making a way for us to go home and see. Yep. Family. <laughs> yeah. So that was like the miracle for us. Oh yeah. Um, because then we apply the next month and, and get it. And get it. So that was like such a special story yeah. with that song. Um, what brought us to that? Well, just, um, you know, what, what changes like when you went at, when you got the Grammy yeah. and then you move on from there, it's, yeah. you were being honest with saying it, it's not like it's, you don't think about those kinds of yeah. things. So I, yeah. Cause once that has happened, then because you've had that experience, yeah. the thought is then in your head, Yeah. but I've just had to constantly sift those thoughts out because I know that that was a miracle that God made oh, for us yeah. to get home. That makes absolute so it's, sense. It's, I think it's, it makes um, it actually 10 times more beautiful. Cause I'm yeah. going to think more about you getting to be able to go home than you ever winning a statue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is really cool. Yeah. That's great. But then here's what I want to talk to you about too, though, because when you have that kind of success and you talk about priesthood mm -hmm. and this is what I, again, this, these are things I love about you. It's why I wanted to, to get you on here because you are so focused on priesthood and focused on, I mean, you actually really are, I think a really incredible pastor in your own right um, in worship and songwriting because you walk in with priesthood on your shoulders mm -hmm. and we're living kind of in a, 
in a deconstructed era in the church where, I mean, in my day, Mitch, you, you, you didn't go to school to be a worship leader. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, it, it, you didn't go to, you know, worship you or what, like that just wasn't a, a yeah. deal. And now it's, it's like a, an art form, yeah. you know, and then there's this kind of showmanship that comes along with it. And it comes along with the clothing line and all, all the things that I, to me have been kind of foreign. Cause it just, those things were never thought about when we were yeah. writing songs, when I was yeah. writing songs for the vineyard. We literally were writing songs so people would get healed because we saw them healed last week. Yeah. And and when you when I think about priesthood, that's the priesthood I think about. It was yeah. like we were carrying in an ark of oil. Yeah. And and we didn't know if these songs would would heal people, but we'd seen them do it last week. So yeah. we were writing to see them do it this week. And along the way, things get attached to the priesthood that kind of pull the anointing off the priesthood mm -hmm. and, and we're living and you see it as, as much as I see it kind of in a, in a day and age where young worship leaders are seeing less of the priesthood and more of the popularity hood, yep. you know, how do you see us changing that? Mm -hmm. And what is our verbal response to a younger generation? Mm telling a younger generation how to write because you know i don't know how many times i'm mentoring every week and pulling up a younger generation to try to not teach them how to write songs that win them grammys mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but write songs that actually um are what the lord is trying to say to the church yeah and bring it back around like in vineyard wimber would tell us um God gives us the songs as the songwriters. We give the songs to the church. Church gives them back to the Lord. Yeah, wow. God gives us That's the songs. Beautiful. We give the songs to the people. The people give them back to the Lord. So it's a constant. That's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never and forgotten that. Priesthood. And I think today there's a big difference between priesthood and performance. Yes. We've got priests and performers. Yes. And both of them are about connection. Performers yeah. are about connecting people to yourself. Yeah. Priests are about connecting either directly to the Lord or the people to the Lord. So I think that cycle of God giving you a song, you giving it to the people, the people giving it to God is such a beautiful yeah. priestly outworking. It's connecting people to God. And I think that heart of priesthood comes from time with the Lord. It really, like, yeah. it really does. But it's, it's more like I grew up in an environment where I love what Planet Shakers taught me when I grew up. Cause I went there from 12 till 26. So, so your parents we were, were in that church mm -hmm. and there was such a reverence and an honor of worship. It was, and I think it helps that it's an Australian church yeah. because yeah, our culture is very different to American culture in itself. Explain that. Well, Australians like back back in history were convicts <laughs> from uh, Great Britain, so we have a very unassuming nature, yeah. and it feels very very odd to kind of uh, loudly dream about something and dream of greatness because. Wow. You, I'm sure you've heard about the tall poppy. Yes, I tall, have. So it's like if you try and if your poppy tries to be taller than anyone else's, we'll just cut you down to our yeah, level. Yeah, that's the uh, like an Australian cultural difference to yeah. America because America um, is a real big supporter of big dreamers, which I love. I think you know when people have a dream, everyone's like, "Yes, you go do it because that's your dream, and you go aspire for greatness." And I think. Every culture has pros and cons. When we came to America and having that support is amazing. But the downside of that is it, you, can, you can dream and it can go to your head. And you're not conscious of the fact that this is not for me. But in Australia and in the Australian church, because we have that default yeah. unassuming attitude, it's very easy for us to, to remember that worship is not about us. And worship oh, well, is okay. That's good. I've never heard this before. Yeah. So I think that 
has really helped me to keep a level head because I've grown up in that culture of, and, and the cons are like, God has called us to greatness. And yeah. sometimes we don't believe that as Australians because we're afraid to dream big, which I think is a bad side to that. Yeah. But I think a good side is there's a beautiful humility of just, I'm just, I'm just Mitch. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. And God is God, you know? Yeah. And I think um, I'm grateful for that experience. Yeah. But as a younger writer and worship leader, I wasn't seen for so long. And I think being hidden in the Lord and yeah. and writing in hiddenness where no one heard the songs, but I would labor for hours and hours on these songs, make demos till 4 a.m. And not yeah. because I felt like I had to. I loved it. Yeah, It was so life-giving to me. But I didn't need those songs to be heard by anyone. I did it because I loved it and because I wanted to do it for God. And I think that is being lost slightly today because I think people are being wanted, uh, people are wanting to be seen earlier and wanting their songs to be listened to early. And that we've lost the hiddenness of wow, writing yeah. for the Lord and yeah. singing for the Lord first. How do we get that back though? How do you teach a, a, a new generation that doesn't have your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, you're here in America. It is different mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. It's very different here. And it's a very self-entitled, you know, we're living in kind of a self, 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 self kind of yeah. a mentality. And I think even more so, I think since COVID, post-COVID. Yeah. And there's this thing attached <clears throat> to the to the brain that creates this anxiety that... Mm -hmm tells you know it's telling this younger generation that god isn't enough mm. um and they've got to find their own resource yeah and I, it's kind of scary to me yeah um because i don't i don't carry that mentality mm -hmm. but i am around it so much that i feel like that i as a as a mother i'm always trying to beg god and ask god like how do we do this how do we do this how do we pull them back because it it in the whole self kind of realm, you almost have to make the choice to want to be hidden in Christ. Yeah. And that's not the popular yeah. thing to do anymore. Because that's not public. No. It's not rewarded. No. And it makes me think, no. you know, this is was this was in the context of fasting and prayer. Yeah. Where Jesus says, you know, the the Pharisees, they they let everyone know that they're fasting and and it's so hard and it, it's publicly seen and that is their reward. And I think there's a generation who is publicly trying to go, I'm a great songwriter, I'm a great worship leader. And they're probably receiving their reward, but it's not as satisfying as the Lord's reward because it's not in hiddenness first. And um, the phrase that comes to my mind is discern the delight. Wow. Discern the delight. And if, if there's, you know, young worship leaders and, and writers listening to this, learn how to discern the delight of the Father and taking time to write those songs, bring them to Him and sing them to Him in your bedroom by yourself yeah. and discern His delight that you've written it for Him. That this is actually, I'm not trying to use this song as a stepping stone to get somewhere else. I'm not trying to write this song to impress someone else and get their delight. I want the father's delight. I want God to be delighted in what I'm doing. And that takes coming to him first yeah. and seeking him first, because I think there are so many songs where it's, and this is not to say every song that you write has to be, you know, you have to like write it and then bring it to the Lord. And then if you want to like, if you feel that songs for someone else, I'm not saying that I'm just saying, the first person who I want to please with my music is God. Mm. Whether I'm in a room with people or whether I'm by myself, I want to discern whether he's delighted with this or not. Yeah. Because I think a lot of us get in the routine of writing songs and then we immediately send them off to somewhere else. or we try and, you know, market it there. And 
that for me is like you're bypassing a really special moment with the Lord first. Yeah, yeah. You're kind of getting straight to like public reward rather than sharing that with God himself. My mentorship program that I do, for years I used to have the dive school where I would pull um, creatives in and spend a week mentoring them. And now um, what I find works best with my kind of busy schedule is I do one-on-one mentorships. You can sign up for those um, on the rudyspringer.com website. There's a mentorship tag. You could um, just uh, uh, click that and then that application will come up. Basically what the mentorship program is, is anybody wanting a one-on-one, they're four-week, one-hour sessions that I do consecutively, one after the other um, by week. And we just schedule you on a Monday or Tuesday I only take around 10 a month is what I can handle, but it has been just a beautiful, beautiful season of just continuing to just encourage worship leaders and creatives and songwriters. Really, you come to the table with um, the subjects that you want to talk about, questions that you have. Um, Maybe they're um, cultivating worship teams on staff Um, in your staff position as a worship leader. Maybe it's just a songwriting course that you kind of won in those four weeks. Maybe you're going through some struggles on staff or struggles in your life that you just want wisdom in walking out. That is what that mentorship program is about and for, and it is really my most favorite thing to do. Uh, I love getting to meet those of you. Some of you are all over the world and Um, My Monday and Tuesdays are my funnest days of the week because I get to interact with you and um, find out about your life and what God's doing with you in um, your call to the creative. And so if you are looking for that kind of a mentorship program, again, go to RitaSpringer.com, click that tab up there that says mentorship, and you can sign up for that and um, we'll get you started on that program. So how how do you then know for you, everybody would probably be different, how do you know that God's delighted with that song? Like what yeah. is, how do you feel the delight of the Lord with that song? I think that's what some people would be like, I wouldn't know yeah. how God would be delighted with that. You know, because it's routine to be like, oh, we, we, we're songwriters. Yeah. So after we write a song, we turn it in. Yeah. And we do, the, you know what I'm saying? But to actually be writing a song and, and actually be thinking, I feel, I feel like you love this song. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? How yeah, is it yeah, for yeah, you? Yeah. Well, before I answer that, it kind of relates to this analogy that I use for for songwriting. Yeah. Where we're just about to have a kid. Baby girl is two it's weeks away. Amazing. And probably in a year and a half, she's going to draw a little scribble that might be us as a family. Is it going to look anything like us? Yeah. No. But it's going to mean the world to me because it came from her heart that's a good analogy yeah and that's what i encourage young songwriters with is it doesn't matter technically whether the craft is good whether the rhymes are good whether the melodies the chords if you've written that from a place of genuine worship and honesty that moves god's heart just as much as a picasso that someone could draw him you know so when i think about whether god's delighted in this song that i've written when I'm trying to discern that, I'm not thinking, is this song technically great? Is it, are the melodies great? Are the, I'm not thinking in, in, in that way. I'm thinking, have I written this from a genuine place mm-hmm. of worship? Have I been honest in this session? Have I been motivated by the right things? And then it could be anything. It could be honestly, technically the worst song. But if I've, if I have like a, a piece that I have done the assignment. I showed up. Yeah. I was honest. I I listened. I had a great conversation with my friends. We shared testimonies and we wrote yeah. a song. I feel his delight in that because I know there's no striving for anything else that's yeah. not godly. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So, and I think as well when I, I do feel his delight on songs that I love as well. Like, what ones that I keep on listening to and, yeah. and, and that minister to me and that I get emotional to, I love that. And I think God enjoys that walking that journey out with us of just sharing that of going, yeah, like this is, I've given yeah. you this gift and look what, look what came of it. You're being ministered to and, 
and you're receiving revelation from yeah, the song. Sometimes for me, that's how I know God's delights on it. Yeah. When I'm broken in the middle of it mm -hmm. and I can't stop listening to it and it's become my manna. Yep. You know, that's yeah, what it I'm feeds like. you. Yeah, it, it feeds absolutely you. feeds you. Yeah. And usually, like you, you, okay, you have a reputation of cooking the best breakfast in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> people have talk I ever about done reading it for you yet no not oh, yet and man, i'm Mitch. i'm waiting for the day <laughs> but do you get delight feeding yeah. someone yes and that's Absolutely. how i think god thinks is yeah he's he's delighted that through the gift he's given you he can serve up a meal and yeah. you can eat from that yeah and be sustained yeah so I think and i do i i love that and i i think trying to trying to uh, school or really encourage a younger generation. The, the hardest part isn't training them how to write a song. And the hardest part isn't like um, even encouraging them to write a song or encouraging them to head toward the priesthood. Mm -hmm. It really is encouraging them to have an encounter. Yeah. To have an encounter with Jesus. Yes. And I think that's the hardest thing. You know, I'm so marveled all the time by... Um, the, the holy thing in Genesis chapter one, which was choice. Mm. Like he didn't have to do it. He didn't mm. give the sky the choice to do anything, but do what the sky does or the, the, um, all, you know, vegetation to just do what they do every yeah. year. They just do it. They don't have a choice, um, until their, their seed is done and yeah. it gives way to something else. The only thing he gave choice to was us. Mm -hmm. And I find that so holy, mm -hmm. like in and of itself, that he's not forcing us to do anything. Yep. But when we do it, we break open something that you will not discover unless you choose it. Mm -hmm. And if you choose the wrong thing, you'll discover what that's going to cost you. Yep. So choice is going to, there's a, there's a penalty. There's a, feeling there's something that comes along with choice but that is the one thing that you almost can't convince people which is just kind of sitting right there in scripture is yeah. that all, all you really have to do is say yes to him and then when you say yes to him and you have that experience then you'll know the language of writing it and being like are you happy with this yeah you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah because you have felt the joy of the Lord in the choosing of God. Yep. And that I think is sometimes as a mom type, it's a little bit more frustrating because you know, when your kids are little, mm. they don't know about consequences and they don't know that what you're trying to do for them is the best choice because yeah. they can't really decide for themselves mm -hmm. and you can explain it to them, but until they grow up and learn it themselves and it's that, mentality that sometimes I feel like I'm in, I'm like, please, he's just amazing. He's amazing. Just choose him. Just choose him. He's amazing. Just give it all to him. Give it all to him. You know, dive into the priesthood, dive into yeah. the presence. He's, yeah. It's everything. But until they do it, mm -hmm. they'll never see the benefits of it. And in the choosing God, you discover that he's enough. Oh, yeah. And I think that is really the bottom line. Yeah. Is God enough for you? Just him, himself. Yeah. Because if he's not, then you'll use songwriting, you'll use worship leading, yeah, absolutely. you'll use all these things to try and fill something that will not be filled until you find it in God. Yeah. And that takes relationship. That takes seeking him and learning from his word. And I think my fear is that people are trying to find enough in the success of songwriting and in the, the accolades, in the awards, all of that, in the streams, in this, yeah. you know, all of the outward stuff. Whereas, and I'm not a perfect person. So I have to always come like, is God enough for me? Yeah. And I have to ask myself that. Yeah. Which is a great question to ask. Yeah. Like, really just sit down and say, is God enough? For yeah. Me? Like, but I think ideally when we, when we find communion with God and we're satisfied yeah. and we know that if nothing else happens beyond this, you are enough yeah. for me. If he took songwriting away from me, I'm not going to crumble yeah. because he's enough. So 
I would be very sad. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to lie. Yeah. But he's enough. So I think moving like moving from that foundation, it's an overflow from what you found in the Lord that you can share with yeah. others rather than a trying to find satisfaction from other people through yeah. what you're doing. It's it's a it's a reverse cycle that leaves you empty yeah so well and i think it's like that is such a um this isn't just about like songwriting and mm. being a songwriter it worship leaders in churches that are trying to maintain or trying to obtain you know um just even love from their congregation or being the best at what they could be i mean we do this in all aspects of of life yeah and and that that foundation that you're talking about should should be should be you should ask that question no matter what your job is mm -hmm. is god enough and that was speaking of genesis 1 that was the whole theme of genesis 1 there's this amazing yeah. podcast called yeah. bema mm. which means the pedestal mm. in the synagogue um it's a hebrew word and this podcast takes it through the the Eastern perspective of scripture wow. from Genesis to revelation. Yeah. And one of the points in Genesis was you have to remember where the Israelites were when they heard Genesis one, it was in the wilderness when they'd come out of Egypt and Moses yeah. had received the download. And for generations, they had been building bricks, making bricks all day. And their worth came from how many bricks did you make today? That was Wow. That was their mentality. Yeah. You do, and then you're worth something because they were slaves. They were making bricks all day and then they were able to survive that way. So their mentality was, I am actually good because of what I do. Yeah. Oof. And then when you go to Genesis one, it's completely the reverse. Adam and Eve didn't do anything. God made them on the sixth day yeah. and he said, this is good. This is you good. are really good. And they hadn't even done anything. They hadn't made any bricks. Yeah. They hadn't cultivated any wow. garden. And that was mind blowing to the Israelites because how could God call us, us good when we haven't done anything? And one of the you know big themes of Genesis is just there is delight um, and there is goodness in just relationship. In just the fact that we're yeah. in communion. Yeah. And I think it works the other way as well. We try and make God do things yeah. and then, oh, you're good. But before God does anything, if we can yeah. say you're good, you're very good. I think that is the most beautiful foundation of a relationship. Wow. And then beyond that, there's doing, there's working, there's right. stuff to do, assignments, all of that. But if you can find that very goodness yeah. without having to do anything and without oh, God so having to do anything and without yeah. us having to do anything. Yeah. yeah. I always say too that for me, worship became relationship. It wasn't even singing. It mm. wasn't attached to, to music or singing. And what I did behind the piano yeah. was an extension or an overflow of what was already going on. 24 seven in my yeah. heart because man, I was just young and I found him Yeah, and I was broken. And so, you know, for many of us, our stories, our, our, our history is a broken history. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, you know, because we're in such a, a, a sinful world, a lot of people will find God in their brokenness. Yeah. And I found God in my brokenness and, and worship became relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the thing I've just held on to yep. because I had that articulation at such a young age that it wasn't like somebody was speaking French to me later on when they were yeah. like, you know what I'm saying? Because it feels like sometimes when you're the same brokenness is here, even yep. almost like I'm talking to some of these youngsters and thinking I never had to do with that when yeah. I, you know, yeah. But so the same brokenness is here. It's just the mentality and how to how to find the altar. Yeah. And then how to trust the altar. Yeah. And how to surrender to the altar. Yes. And the surrender and the trust is actually what you find from it is still the same. Yeah. But it's it's the mode of surrender. Yes. That's that I find in this 
really weird way that the church is right now mm -hmm. in kind of the deconstruction of it all that it, it's it's a harder for people to bend yeah and, no, and it find is. the priesthood yeah but it's so much easier for them to, to dance a jig yeah. and perform absolutely if you ever want to donate to the podcast and to um, ways that you can help support the ministry um, we have a Venmo uh, attached to this as well that is with my nonprofit Wearing Justice. You're more than welcome to donate to that, um, which is greatly appreciated. That's a big uh, attack against worship yeah. is the definition of it. Yes. Because we've tried to pigeonhole worship as, you know, just a few songs. Yeah. But the true and proper worship that the Bible defines is to be a living sacrifice. Yeah. And you go back to the first mention of the word worship in the Bible. Yeah. It's Abraham taking Isaac yeah. up the mountain That's to right. offer him on the altar. Yeah. So if, yeah. if there's no sacrifice, there is no worship. There is no worship. So yeah. I think it's, and in today's culture, yeah. to sacrifice and to lay it all on the altar yeah. is perhaps getting harder, but it's doesn't mean it's not as necessary. Right as it always yeah. has been. And I think I, I love that you said worship is relationship because when I think about worship relationship in the Bible, it's Abraham because he had relationship enough yeah. with the Lord. Yeah. I, I just love how Paul reasons uh, in the New Testament. He's like, Abraham had such a good relationship with God that he thought the only option left, the, the only reason why God is asking me to give Isaac up as a sacrifice is because I know he's going to resurrect him. And yeah, I, that, mean, I mean, the faith in that of just knowing that God's given you a promise yeah. and he's asking you to sacrifice oh, yeah. it, but trusting his word enough to know, Oh no, it's, it's going to be even, okay. Yeah. It's going to be okay. And that's relationship. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's kind of actually profound. You don't think of as even as a parent, Doing something like that, I mean, you you having the relationship with the Lord, it's like, okay, but we all know that sometimes God doesn't, but when you love him enough, mm. it's like, yeah, but he will. Yeah. Like at the end, he's got, he, he's got me, he yeah. has me, everything's going to be. But you as a parent, like you, you don't go into that thinking that yeah. it's all going to go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, it's just a crazy... You have to have some kind of trust in God. Absolutely. But it and takes it some stuff to get there. It produces cre creativity too, yes. though, because we are so used to the idea of resurrection from the dead. Yeah. Because it's our faith. Jesus yeah. resurrected from the dead. Back in Abraham's time, can you imagine how otherworldly that would have, yeah. the idea of that yeah. would have been? There was no Bible that he could read of yeah. a savior resurrecting no from the grave. Yeah. So, even the fact that he had that thought of, yeah, oh, wow, yeah. if I kill Isaac, it must mean God will make him alive again. Like that's such a creative idea yeah. of faith. And I think trust with the Lord Whew. produces creativity of how, his, how he could move and how we can ask him to move and what we can believe for him to do that yeah. isn't seen yet. Wow, so, that's so good. Yeah. That's so good. Now, do you ever think you'll be a pastor? Oh. <laughs> well, that's your own church yeah. no <laughs> not unless god you never know Mitch. no i mean if god says so but i i have felt probably since i was early 20s that a worship pastor was somewhere down the line yeah and you i know. i think it's really good to to also insert that as songwriters and worshipers and worship leaders I mean, we are pastoring in, yeah. in some sense, but knowing the word and knowing how to to teach the word or describe the word should actually be on all of our resumes. Oh, yeah. Because if you're writing songs about the Lord, if you're writing songs to the Lord, it's probably a really good idea to like, yeah. have some scripture up yeah. your sleeve. I have this you know? holy fear <laughs> because you can write pop songs all you want. Yeah. That's fine. If you want to write songs that the bride the church of god sings and songs that teach people who jesus is yeah that's a whole nother that's level it's a whole nother level it's and so it says hard. it says don't presume to be a teacher yeah because if you do 
you're going to be held to a higher standard in judgment yeah. of like, did you, did you do this well? <laughs> yeah. And that for every Christian songwriter who's writing songs for the church, you're teaching. Yeah. So welcome yeah. to the higher standard. That's right. Yeah. Because it's, it's a responsibility. So I always say like, it really is a, a mantle and a responsibility mm. to know our word, to know Jesus. And if there are any red flags, even yellow flags in songs that I'm like, is that yeah. true? Does it say that in the word? Is that, is that, Yeah. I'm always saying that in songwriting sessions because I have this conviction. I do not want to be held responsible yep. Yep. for teaching a wrong Jesus. Yeah. That is so well, scary and, and to me. It, it's I always, I'm always like, man, the pressure of writing congregational songs I mean, I, I can write a country song in a 15 minute, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. But it's, there is a pressure and I love that pressure. I, <clears throat> I want same. that pressure on me every time I go in because, mm -hmm. um, it's a relief not to have to write one. I say yep. that a lot. Oh, thank God. Today's a country song. Yeah. And because the pressure is off it, but yeah. that pressure is there for a reason. Yes. And it's a good, it's a holy pressure. Yeah. But it is, it is a pastoral yes, priestly absolutely, office. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, because you're shepherding people. Yeah. Because the way that music is reaching people these days, we live in such a biblically illiterate oh. generation. Yeah. So that's another conversation in itself. But yeah. like a lot of the ways that people are learning the faith and learning the gospel is through music, yeah. it's through songs. Yeah. So it really is pastoral yeah. and yeah. we have to take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in close, last question I'm going to ask you is what, well, obviously you're becoming a father, so that's going to be a massive, beautiful journey that you're yeah. about to walk into, which I'm so excited for you. Thanks. Um, and a little girl. Girl. Um, but what, it, do, are you like the kind of guy or the kind of person that is like in five to 10 years, I want to be doing this? Mm. Are, you that, are you kind of a... You're not. No. <laughs> you just live day by day. Yeah. I've never lived with five year goals. Wow. Just, I think I, I have goals to accomplish what's been put in my heart. Yeah. So for example, um, I'm working on a, a project. Yeah. I've got a few ideas for projects Yeah. and I want to be faithful to, to look after those ideas and do them yeah. well. But in terms of, Five years down the road. Yeah. I just want to be a good husband, good dad. Yeah. Good, good son to God, good and, family member to my family. You know, I mean, yeah. that's kind of just the long term stuff. Because with this line of like what we do, yeah. it's so hard to, yeah. to think like that. It, it I think is. It, it is. I think it it's harder than so something. Much. Yeah. It's harder than something like a corporate job where mm. there's kind of like a pathway that makes sense. But with, worship writing yeah i think i just want to i want to say yes to the open doors that god wants me to walk yeah. through and and do it faithfully that's yeah and i don't know if you're like me i mean sometimes the way that the lord does <clears throat> stuff with me is it doesn't he might call me to something totally different yeah you know um, yeah. i'm uh, in the last 10 years i've done things i'm like oh, i would never thought i'd be doing that mm -hmm. you know and i think that that is part of just staying open yeah and willing and honoring like and this podcast yeah where did that the seed I, of that come from yeah and because that it feels like okay looking from the outside in that is something i aspire to yeah. is to have a seed of an idea yeah and then to do it yeah <laughs> it's, it's simple but i love that you're doing it yeah because when we do things when we have <clears throat> ideas from the lord and then we're obedient. It creates space. Oh, yeah. And it's like a vacuum. Yeah. Because he'll fill it, whatever space yeah. we give him. Yeah. And, so, and it is. I mean, when you have like, when you have a concept or you are actually for me, it's always like a nudge, like a nudge mm -hmm. of encouragement. And there's always the backlash of, ugh, that was just, I I can't even imagine how to even go about doing that. I get, yep. And so the, the seed kind of has to play itself out with mm. my anguish mm -hmm. and my yeah. doubt yeah. and my unbelief. Yeah. And I think it's the beauty and the testimony of God in anything that we do in our lives too, the, that the Lord will just keep kind of, <clears throat> and then he'll send people to be like, you ought to do this and you ought to yeah. do this. 
and you're like, oh, okay, okay, that's I've been said a few times. And then, you know, what, five years down the road, you know, it's it's been through a couple hills and valleys. Yeah. And and now I'm at a place where I'm like, I five years ago, I was laughing at this idea. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. So, but it is true that because of what we do, my um my posture with the Lord has always been hold it very lightly. Yep. Because tomorrow you might write a a, a hit that hits home for so many people, mm -hmm. and the next day you might write a song that heals one person that heals it, and you'll never know their name until yep. you. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Which and I if, love that. I love I love yeah. it too. I it's, I I call my LLC One Seat Theater. Because oh of a conversation I've had with the best. Lord where he's like, there's only one seat in That's that theater. That's amazing. And, and every time I'm doing an event, yeah. the first thing I do in my mind when I close my eyes and get ready to, to leave is that he's the only one in the room, wow. you know, in a, wow. in a massive beautiful. theater. So anyway. Just quickly, it makes, that talking about the nudge, it makes yeah. me think, um, I was talking to my friend Josh the other day. He just, he and Kayla just had their son last week. His name is Duke. And he was named after a Hawaiian man called Duke someone, um, a Hawaiian name. I can't pronounce yeah. it, but incredible story. They were watching a documentary on his life. It's called The Waterman, I think. And there was in Hawaii, I think a race, it was a hundred meter swim. And he just had this feeling, this little nudge. He's like, oh, I bet you I could do pretty good if I did that. So... He ran the he he swam the race, won it, broke the world record for Agreed. the hundred meters. Eventually, that leads to him going to the Olympics, got three gold medals. Eventually, that leads to him going to Australia, because he had a friend from Australia. Like long story, it's beautiful. But he goes to Australia, introduces surfing as a sport to Australia. They had no idea what oh it was. Oh my goodness! And. Josh loves surfing. So it's kind of all connected, but it's amazing what God can do. I don't even know if he's a Christian, to be honest. Yeah. So I think the principle stands though. It's yeah. amazing what he can do if you say yes you to, say a yes nudge. to a nudge. Because it's, it, it's kind of like God works like that. He works in seeds. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, ha we can have dreams of we want to change the whole world and do massive things. But I think so often... He speaks to us and nudges yeah. and and surprises us. There's yeah. such joy in so that. Good. And that's the same with me in Nashville because it was a nudge of going, stay in Melbourne if you want. Great. I'll bless it. It's going to be awesome. If you want to jump in the deep end with me here and see what happens, let's go. That was my nudge. Yeah. And Without even a guarantee, <clears throat> it, it, let's see what happens. See what happens. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. Oh, that could mean anything. Lord. But I just love that God is... It's fun. Yeah. It's really fun it's being obedient sure. to the nudge. So yeah. that's so good. Yeah. Thanks, Mitch. You're the best. Love you. Thanks for having <laughs> me.